Our moderator today is Stephanie Grace. Stephanie, you probably have seen her before. She started her journalistic career in Philadelphia, I think, went to Los Angeles, has been here for a long time, worked for the Old Times Picayune, now works for the Newish Advocate, and you might have seen her on Friday nights for Informed Sources. So everybody, please welcome Stephanie. Well, I'm not on informed sources today because I'm here, so <laughs> had to say no to Errol. Is this on? Is this working okay? Okay. That, oh, wow. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie Grace. Thanks so much for coming. We have a, a panel that hopefully will be kind of freewheeling today because the topic is broad and interesting and um, super timely, I would say. Uh, politics in the media, how did we get here? Uh, let me start in by introducing our panelists. Um, I'm going to go in alphabetical order, so not in this order. Doug Brinkley, who's three down, is a lot of you probably have also seen on TV. He's the Catherine something Brown, Sanoff <laughs> Brown, Chair in Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University. He's a presidential historian for CNN, contributing editor at Vanity Fair, and he has written bio biographies of quite a number of presidents, um, starting with the Roosevelts, are they the earliest? Both Roosevelts, Teddy and Franklin. Uh, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, he's edited the Nixon Diaries. Um, next we have Robert Fiesler. Thank you, I just asked and I've forgotten already. I'm sorry, Robert Fiesler, who's a recipient, who's right here, who's the recipient of the Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship and the Linton Fellowship in Book Writing. Uh, his first book is actually about New Orleans. It's called Tinderbox, The Untold Story of the Upstairs Lounge Fire and the Rise of Gay Liberation. Um, and it's a, it's a terrific book. It's, uh, Lane Kaplan-Levinson is the host and producer of WWNO's history podcast, Tripod, New Orleans at 300. That's the local in Paris station. And was formerly the station's coastal producer. And she's here because she did a terrific series called Sticky Wicket, looking at various Louisiana politicians through history and their relationship um, with the press, starting with Huey Long and uh, kind of up through Kathleen Blanco. And then at the end is Tom Sancton. He is the former Paris bureau chief for Time magazine. He's written a number of books, including Song for My Father's, Death of a Princess, The True Story Behind Diana's Tragic Ending. And his most recent book is called The Betancourt Affair which recounts the real life story of the world's richest woman, L'Oreal heiress Lillian Betancourt, and the younger man that she showered gifts upon. It became a big political scandal. The power structure in France was involved, and um, a good story. And I'm going to start with Doug, I think, because you have, you're have you kind of the long view guy. Um, I think we can all agree that we haven't really seen anything like the period we're in now with Donald Trump and the media, or have we? That would be my question. Uh, are there previous relationships between presidents and the press that you think have come close to what we're seeing now or have maybe set the groundwork or trends that we're seeing culminating right now? Or is this something totally well, new? Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I love the Tennessee Williams um, Festival. Um, look, we've never had a president that has declared the press the enemy of the people. Um, so, the, you know, when you hear the most overused word of our time, unprecedented, it is unprecedented. Um, now, there are all presidents have carping about the press, and some deal with them in different ways. Um, you know, in my career writing about presidents, you know, in modern, you know, in the the old days, like when Thomas Jefferson was president, you know, the State of the Union was just handwritten and delivered. It wasn't a media event. Uh, but now, in the age of modern communications, presidents have to project a lot. Uh, we t think about Theodore Roosevelt as being the first modern media president, uh, but it because in those days, he manipulated cartoonists. Wherever he would go, he would give cartoonists an equal seat at the table. <laughs> uh, he, they'd be in the White House and all, and he would use them to go and uh, attack his opponents. Here in the southern zone in Mississippi, uh, famously the teddy bear cartoon, Clifford Berryman of the Washington Post, uh, T.R. went hunting in Mississippi with Holt Collier, African-American bear hunter, 
and they roped a bear and they wouldn't, um, they, they, TR wouldn't shoot the bear because that was not fair chase hunting. And also Theodore Roosevelt went in Governor Bardman's backyard in Mississippi to say no to lynching, federal anti-lynching laws of African Americans. So the cartoon Clifford Berryman did had a rope around the neck of a bear slash um, African American saying, drawing the line in Mississippi, no to lynching, no to hunting. And a woman um, who ran a toy company in Brooklyn wrote, Dear Mr. President, I would like to do a teddy bear. And uh, he got back a, uh, he said, Madam, you're welcome to do it, but nobody's gonna care. <laughs> it's the most ubiquitous toy in the world. And if you think that's so easy, um, William Howard Taft tried to do the Billy Possum toy. <laughs> and, uh, and nobody bought it. And none of the, none of the if, if, instead of showing, TR was always heroic in these cartoons. Taft was, as you know, always like seeing it stuck in the bathtub or, you know, unable to get up due to his girth. Um, but so after that age of cartoon, uh, I think TR was the best president for press. But of course, you know, I mean, Herbert Hoover had had access to radio. It wasn't invented in 1933 by FDR, but nobody used radio like Franklin Roosevelt because he was governor of New York. He had won the governorship in eight, um, 1928 and then won again, I mean, it won it in, in, um, and was governor in 1930 to 32. And the radio had been around, but he's the one who, who went into New York City being a New York, I mean, Dutchess County, New York guy and learn how to get it across on radio and, and seduce people with fireside chats and the like. In more modern times, Jack Kennedy invented the press conference. That was radical thinking. Uh, every, even his own advisor said that's a train wreck because no script, lay it on me, I'll answer your questions, but it became must watch television because it was kind of unscripted and you never knew what was gonna happen. Kennedy was great at it. Ronald Reagan went back to doing old fashioned television speeches and turning like State of the Unions into theatrical events by calling people from the audience and all of this. Um, and Barack Obama, you remember the Blackberry presidency and then you think of Donald Trump with Twitter. Um, but the truth of the matter is, being a master of Twitter is equal to being a master of insults. And he is an insulter in chief. And we've never had a president that's constantly using the media to divide the country in this deeply, deeply kind of personal um, way. Obvious parallel is Richard Nixon. Nixon kept his enemies list of press. Many good reporters you know, like my, my friend here, you know, they, they got, of that of the earlier generation, they were embarrassed if they weren't on the enemies mm. list of Nixon. <laughs> I met a few of them, like the writer Hunter S. Thompson used to be so, the biggest failure of my life was not being on Nixon's <laughs> enemies list. Um, and you see Donald Trump continuing that Nixonian, Spiro Agnew-like uh, beating of the mainstream media, the press as, the, uh, as being a, somehow an alien force, something that's wrong with America. That's a trick that usually uh, authoritarians do is try to, to isolate the press and demonize them. Real quickly, do you think the sense of grievance that we get from Donald Trump, is it pretty much on par with how Nixon felt or is it worse, is it more so? You mean with the, in what way? Uh, the way the president f seems to feel so aggrieved by press coverage. Oh, uh, well, he's a narcissist, as we all know. I'm a, you know, breaking news. A narcissist, <laughs> n n narcissists don't like to be insulted. They, they get narcissistic injury. And he gets injured when he sees a bad report on himself. And when a narcissist gets injured, you lash out. And that's what he does. And the fact that's unusual is that he's watching this stuff all the time. I edited Ronald Reagan's diaries. Uh, and Reagan, what Reagan used to do was say, I'm, not, I, I'm not, never going to demonize the press because if I did, I'd be in a hateful mood all the time. Everybody's writing bad stuff about you. So he just kind of float over it. He never knew who wrote something bad about him or not. So if he went into a press conference, he'd say, oh, hey, Bob, <laughs> hey, John, do you want a jelly bean? You know, and, uh, and so he never got himself all lathered up. And hence, he has a great durability, Reagan, in history. 
because even though the, most of the press was more liberal, none of the reporters or photographers you talked to hated Reagan in person. They do not like Donald Trump because he spends his day mocking them, belittling them, telling them they're stupid, telling you what an idiot, what a dumb question in this kind of uh, nonstop way. Interesting, okay. I'm gonna go over to Lane now. Uh, Doug mentioned that Donald Trump calls the press enemy of the people. Huey Long kind of considered, I don't know if he used that phrase, but he considered the press his enemy too, and yet he got a lot of coverage, and you talked about that in your series. I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about some of the parallels you see. Yeah, I mean, also, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And everything that you just said, you could say about Huey Long. The only difference is that he never became the president. But he wanted to. If, if he hadn't been assassinated, there's a chance that he would have. And obviously, history uh, could have been very, very different. But the parallels between the current president and Huey uh, P. Long, the former governor of Louisiana, and then U.S. Senate senator, and then, you know, pre-presidential candidate, the parallels are just unbelievable. I mean, he, you know, tried to put a tax on all of the newspapers and took it all the way to the Supreme Court, and it, you know, it failed, but he tried. And the goal of taxing the newspapers was to have them go bankrupt, essentially, so that they wouldn't exist anymore. He went after LSU newspapers, like 18-year-olds writing op-eds. You know, he ran into their newsroom and ripped up the cover page before it went to print and had people expelled. So he didn't really care in this Trumpian way if you were a fellow politician or if you were a freshman, you know, practicing your, your journalism skills. He was monitoring every single thing that people were saying about him in this, in this obsessive way. Um, once that tax on the newspapers failed in the Supreme Court, he decided, you know, I'm just going to start my own newspaper. Um, and it's essentially, you know, the Fox News for Trump is the Louisiana Progress, which Huey Long started as his own newspaper that he had people writing um, and forced all Louisiana uh, politicians, all the Congress people to disseminate it and put it, you know, deliver it to people's homes so people were reading it. Um, he didn't flat out say that the press was the enemy of the people in terms of saying that exact sentence, but he called the newspapers the lying newspapers. Um, you know, the lying newspapers, they never tell the truth about me. Um, don't listen to what the newspapers are saying about me. Listen to what I'm saying about me, because that's the only thing that you can believe. Agenda. Um, so in the ways that he was totalitarian, especially when it came to trying to control the press, um, and when it came to you know being totally ruthless in insulting his opponents, um, similarly to Donald Trump, politically, he was essentially a Bernie Sanders. Like, it's this crazy uh, mashup that we can't, totally imagined today, but he was a democratic socialist, which he just wasn't really called a democratic socialist then, or, or that wasn't used in the same way, but he was for, you know, free healthcare, free education, you know, totally flipping the infrastructure system upside down and, and um, having the government pay for tons of roads and bridges across the state, which he did. And so, in some ways, all of these people in Louisiana who, you know, loved him, um, especially poor people who he was really pandering to, he was delivering. And so while he was doing these ridiculous things on the political stage, he was following through with his promises to, you know, adult literacy and to, as we know in Louisiana, which is filled with waterways, actually letting people that lived in super rural areas access other parts of the state. Um, and he was the person to do that. So he's, he's more complex in some ways because you have this dictator of sorts, um, and then you also have this person that was really following through on these socialist uh, agenda items. Um, right, I mean, they both did have a, they do have a populist thing going, and, yeah. um, which is interesting, and kind of cast maybe the press as part of the elite, and I'm for the little guy, that construct maybe carries over. Um, I want to go to Tom. I, I'm wondering, is this moment we're seeing, and I'm talking about uh, Donald Trump's relationship with the press, and also 
the levels of mistrust in the press, the balkanization of the mm. audience, things like that. Is that an American phenomenon? What do you, no. How would you compare it to Europe? No, I think the same things are, are going on in Europe. Uh, of course, France has very different traditions about the relationship of, between the government, the political world, and, and the press. Um, traditionally, you know, in France, the um, newspapers belong to political parties or politicians. So uh, through the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, they were really not much more than uh, vehicles for, for propaganda. So there's, there's this, this tradition. There's also kind of a complicitous relationship between the government and the and journalists traditionally in France. It's very different from the Anglo-Saxon tradition where you have a, a really a separation of powers, almost an adversarial relationship between the press and the government. In France, it's, uh, it's a cozier relationship. It's more complicitous. It's, uh, um, the journalists and the, um, and the politicians tend to be from the same world. They go to the, often went to the same elite schools. You know, they belong to the same clubs. They're, you know, they're part of the, the same, uh, same social class. So there's a, and, and it's kind of a residue of, of a monarchical situation where the journalists, to some extent, play, play the role of courtiers. And that's a tr tradition It's very different from ours. However, there are uh, increasingly in, uh, is a tradition of investigative jour journalism that's much more critical of the of the power structure and uh, it, which exposes gleefully the Canal en Chine is one that's a satirical weekly that gleefully exposes uh, all sorts of uh, government scandals and political scandals. So. Um, as I say, all, the, all that all that's to say that the, the tradition of the relationship between the government and the media is is very different. Now, what's happening today is very similar to what we, we're seeing uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. You have a, a rise of a populist current that that's um, basically saying, you know, none of the above. That suspects that the uh, the power elite is is corrupt and it's in league with the with the corrupt media, and we see that with the the yellow jacket movement. I hope everybody's somewhat familiar with that, but it's basically a we're mad as hell and we're not going to take any more movement, popular movement that has really no structure, no leadership, but it's been going on since, since November. And um, one of their uh, tenets is, is a, a real hostility to the press. They accuse the press of, um, of bias and of, uh, of misrepresenting them. And this, uh, this is, has led them, in several cases, to, to react violently against journalists. They've, they've roughed up journalists who, who've come to cover these demonstrations. They've uh, uh, attacked several headquarters of, uh, of a couple of TV and radio stations. And uh, recently, two weeks ago, they, they burned a couple of uh, press kiosks on the Champs-Élysées to mark their hostility to the, to the media in general. So you have that. You have the... The effect of the social media, which sort of is this echo chamber for uh, all sorts of uh, uh, tropes and, and fake news, and uh, this is uh, was of such concern to the current president uh, uh, Macron that he uh, he actually p uh, passed a uh, an anti fake news law in no in uh, November, which okay. which uh, which how is does that work? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know how it she works. Here, here's how it's supposed to work. Uh, he, he was afraid, and partly this is a reflection of what the Russians did to us and what, what the, he feared that maybe they probably are doing uh, in Europe as well. But uh, it was basically centered on electoral periods. And the law says that during the three months before an election, that uh, if, in, if anybody, particularly candidates, uh, sees something in the media, in, um, online or in the, in the press, that's, uh, that they consider untrue, they can then uh, make an appeal to a judge, a special judge, who has 48 hours to decide whether this is true or not. Generally, it takes a longer time to, to do some, in, some uh, research. But, uh, and after that period, a judge can then, can then pull this, this information. Um, so I don't know if it's actually been applied yet, but it's, uh, it's w widely criticized as an attack on democracy and, and freedom of speech. And it's also... Uh, to some extent unnecessary because there's an 1881 law in the books that, m that makes it illegal to, to circulate uh, untruthful, okay. untruthful news. Is, is there any kind of um, fact-checking apparatus, do you know? Like we've, we have here at the Washington Post, there are a number of organizations that have really taken that on. Is um, <coughs> I'm not aware of anything in any, any systematic way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But, you know, 
different um, publications do to do like point to things that are untrue, but I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure that they're they've done it in any in okay. any systematic way. I'm going to move to Robert. When we talk about politics and um, media, we often talk about coverage of people who are in power. But the flip side is the coverage of people who are more traditionally powerless. Mm. Um, and that includes the people you wrote about in, in your book. And I, I thought the introduction was so interesting because you drew some really um, stark contrast between how the upstairs fire was covered back in 1973 and how the Pulse Club shooting mm. was covered in, what, 2016. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about that. And also, the changes you talked about really seem to be part of larger societal changes, of course. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, do you see the press as a leader in those changes or kind of a follower? Mm. Um, well, first of all, um, I just want to say that it's an honor to be on this panel, and I want to take, thank the Tennessee Williams Literary Festival for having me. I also want to acknowledge that my husband, Ryan Leitner, is in the audience, specifically because, I'm just going to say it straight up, um, anyone he, uh, who writes a book um, and doesn't end up either sleeping outdoors or divorced <laughs> at the end of it, it's because somebody married a saint. So can we please <laughs> give a round of applause for my husband? <laughs> All right. Um, so you asked about uh, the Pulse nightclub shooting vis-a-vis uh, -vis the upstairs lounge fire. Um, so it was interesting. when um, The Pulse nightclub shooting happened at about a midway point um, where I was writing about the upstairs lounge fire, which for those who don't know is a notoriously unsolved arson fire at a gay bar uh, in 1973 New Orleans uh, that claimed 32 lives. Um, it was called, um, it, it was referred to later on as the upstairs lounge fire, but the, ca the, it, the catastrophe is and was the deadliest on fire on record in New Orleans history. Um, yet, and yet in its day, it received just a few days of media coverage, especially nationally, but also locally too. It petered out within a few days, of, um, within about three days actually, in its time due, due to ra rampant anti-gay bigotry. Um, and so when I was writing initially a book about the upstairs lounge, um, my publisher was fascinated in it, and a lot of people were interested to learn about it when I was talking to them about this book I was writing, but it was a kind of an obscure gay event off to the side. And then suddenly, at the halfway point, I mean, really in the midst of the manuscript, uh, for the uh, for a tender box about the upstairs lounge, the Pulse nightclub shooting happened, and within um, really it was in a span of minutes, um, comparisons were being drawn on Reddit. You know, photographs suddenly of the upstairs lounge victims were uh, circulating widely, and people began to cite this terrible event as this kind of historic antecedent to the Pulse nightclub shooting as a way to try to understand and give context to this nightmare that was unfolding in Orlando. Um, the Pulse nightclub shooting broke a record that was never meant to be broken. It replaced um, the upstairs lounge fire as the deadliest event to strike LGBTQ plus Americans um, in U.S. history. And um, what the event really did in, in a strange way was that um, it became a, a national cause de celebre. It was like the, it was the the f point of focus uh, of media event for several weeks, and. Um, I mean, President Obama recognized it. Federal buildings flew their flags at half staff. I was just every um, the uh, the Republican governor of Florida right. took an interest Marco in this. Rubio yeah, the um, very conservative senator senators were making statements. Um, none of that stuff happened at all for the upstairs lounge victims. Um, and what was interesting when you pair the two events, even though they're they're kind of ci they became cited in relation to each other, they are different in many ways. Um, but they almost served as a point of contrast or, pro or proxy, where you see, um, you asked about whether or not the press takes the lead in the case of uh, coverage for oppressed or minority groups. In the case of the Pulse nightclub shooting, that was certainly what happened. The press, uh, the press coverage of the, ups uh, of, of the Pulse nightclub shooting in some ways was reflective of common American attitudes towards the phenomenon of sexual difference, right? We live in a country now where the majority of Americans favor gay marriage, don't think, think that homosexuality should be illegal, um, would support a couple, uh, a same-sex couple wanting to adopt children. Um, back in the 1970s, when the upstairs lounge fire was not covered by the media, guess what? 
gay marriage was, uh, was never even referred to except in jest. It didn't exist. It was, um, homosexuality was criminalized, and in addition to being criminalized, it was, was pathologized. So many homosexuals were considered sex criminals at the time. The word gay was controversial and news publications would not uh, even dare to publish the word gay uh, for fear of giving credence to what was then considered a very radical political movement um, that, was, that was bringing, quote unquote, in the 70s, sexual psychopaths to the fore. And the, the notion of, uh, of the average American supporting same-sex couples who are adopting a child, obviously not commonplace. I was finding, uh, very common, you know, their values opinions polls from the 70s that said seven out of 10 Americans believed at that time homosexuality to be always wrong, always. And then a, a stranger poll than that was that one, more than, it was about 35% of Americans opposed the notion of the idea of a homosexual being allowed to speak in public. Right, because it was the it was then the equivalent. You got you have to you have to transpose yourself into that mentality, but um, of the criminalization, right, and patholo pathologization of of sexual difference. But it was it would be the modern equivalent of giving, perhaps, bullhorns to the mentally ill and uh, allowing them to scream on a street corner. That that's what it was considered. And so when you, when you're when you're cons when you're thinking about a traumatic emergency event that affects the gay community happens in that environment in the past, in that sort of emotional milieu. What you get is a press oftentimes mimicking those attitudes. So the day after the upstairs lounge fire, um, the Times-Picayune, when they, when they printed their front page story about, the, about the, this bar that had burned, um, actually, I should note, because I, and I can't believe I've, I've spoken this long and not even noted this, which happened just a block away on the corner of Iberville and Charters, actually. All this historic event, um, the, the suspected arsonist was actually believed to have purchased uh, the bottle of Ronsonol lighter fluid that he used to set the fire in the front staircase of the bar that's actually located right above what would be called the Gemini now. He, it's believed that he bought it over at the Walgreens that was just across the street from this hotel. Um, so the press coverage, I mean, the Times-Picayune wouldn't even mention that the first day that, that the upstairs lounge was a homosexual bar, that it had served homosexual clientele. It wasn't until there was criticism that first day and then um, a, a very brave article that was put out in the New York Times um, by a, uh, a very famous civil rights journalist who gets a lot of credit for his work in racial civil rights, a guy named Roy Reed, who reported, uh, reported on an event, called, an event called Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. I don't if you haven't seen the film or read about this, it's definitely worth checking out. But Roy Reed reported the, story, uh, the breaking story for the New York Times on the upstairs lounge fire. Um, and that Monday, when his story published, it was the first and actually only story um, in breaking coverage to include what was then considered a incredibly offensive word about the nature of this fire that Roy Reed told me himself before he died. He said it, it, was, uh, it was an unavoidable fact is the only reason why he reported this story. The, only, the first and only story actually that he'd ever reported at that time period to cover, the, to, to cover this community, he reported that the upstairs lounge was a homosexual bar and it irked his editors at the National Desk of the Times. Wow. And you also talk about some of the reporters, local reporters who were concerned that even naming victims would be outing them in death, kind of against their will and mm. almost hurting them. There was that concern and also the concern of embarrassing and shaming families who were at that time debating um, internally whether or not they were going to step forward and claim the bodies of their loved mm -hmm. ones who had perished in such an establishment. I mean, yeah. this topic was so taboo at that point. Wow. Okay, um, okay I'm going to shift gears a little bit and throw it open to everybody and um, go back to current events because what do, yet again we've had a week that we've, you know, the type of which we've never lived through before. Uh, play media critic for a minute and tell me what you think of how the press has covered the Mueller investigation. Anyone? Well, the um, couple things, be, uh, just before I touch that, uh, spot on analogy with Huey Long. I'm asked a lot at, at um, being CNN historian and, and you know, what, who is Donald Trump most like? And you could get back, go back to the Know Nothing Party 
which was anti-immigrant parties. You go to Joe McCarthy. Uh, but when you deal with the issue of president or leaders in the press, it is Huey Long. And uh, Alicia Long wrote a very good article for the Louisiana Vista, Cultural Vista a magazine about that. On the upstairs lounge fire, you know, Barack Obama saved Stonewall in New York as a national monument. Mm. And it's the first LGBTQ national monument in the system, the national park system. Mm -hmm. And I hope this extraordinary work you've done, the upstairs lounge fire there, at least could be a historic uh, marker mm. um, commemorating it here. And it might be something that could be born from this panel. Um, mm, that, I hope so. And marker I hope comes so. Um, the um, the um, Mueller report, I found out just through you, some of you probably have heard um, that it just got announced that it looks like the full, so called full report will be out in mid April. Um, Attorney General Barr is just um, committed to that. Now, the bigger question is what does that mean? How much redaction is in it? I mean, because what, what happens to me with these kind of documents a lot when you look for them is you just see redactions that go on for pages and pages uh, long. Uh, but there are some reasons to redact some names and all from the documents. So let's hope that it's a full report um, that um, we're going to have our hands on, and it'll become uh, widespread. You'll see it at airports. There'll be it'll be uh, uh, everywhere, meaning book companies and all. Because right. we we were just talking about it's public domain, mm -hmm. so it's and going to. And the Star to Report was published and printed and sold. And yeah, you know, and yeah. you know, I was a judge for the National Book Award when 9/11 with the 9/11 Commission. I just happened to be a judge, and our group of judges for the National Book Award chose. The 9-11 Commission Report is one of the, wow. it got nominated for. Hmm. Okay. Um, so these can be well done, and we'll have to see how uh, Bob Mueller's um, report reads out. There's go Democrats are going to be reading for details to continue to go after Donald Trump. Uh, and the devil in the detail idea that uh, whatever Barr says, no collusion, no proof of obstruction of justice. There are so many uh, large, giant breadcrumbs to follow that are coming out of this um, report that I think will be, it's going to get inflammatory here in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. I'll be interested to know whether B Mueller ever goes to, um, a, goes to Capitol Hill and, and is, um, goes, to, you know, and has to testify and, or, and uh, speak about this. It's kind of odd that here's somebody that we all know, we Mueller, 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 <laughs> history's gonna be Trump and Mueller and he's gone. Mm. Need no TV interview. We, we don't even know what his voice sounds like. Don't even know what his voice. He's like yeah. a, the mystery man, right. and so we'll have to uh, we'll have to follow it. I don't think though Democrats in 2020 are going to be able to run first and foremost on the Mueller report. They're going to have to run on health care and jobs mm -hmm. and equality and anti-Trumpism has to be just part of it. Uh, and so Mueller might be a contributor for the Democrats, but I don't think it's the big story in mm -hmm. 2020. You'd agree though, right, that the press right now is eating a little bit of crow over the Mueller report, mm -hmm. but just based off of the, the tiny little snippet. I mean, how many quoted words were provided in Barr's little summary uh, that came out? But I mean, for months, if not years, I, Mr. Mueller was cited as this paragon of, of uh, leadership that's most, the most incredible prosecutor to be exists, and the press really defended him for a long span of time. And so following, uh, following all of that for the report to not find conspiracy and also to, as they're saying the word punt, um, on, uh, on obstruction of justice to an attorney general that already had written a, paper, a policy paper where he felt a certain strong way about obstruction of justice, it places the press in a, in a strange kind of bind until the full report comes yeah. out. I think he's, I think that Trump, obviously, I'm not telling you anything you all don't know, is greatly re enhanced by this. Uh, it's the first time he hasn't had an asterisk next to his name. Mm -hmm. He was elected with all of these deep investigations, not collusions, in other words, for treason in a way, if it could have been proven. So he's been kind of like a Damascus sword hanging over him. He's like been, and there's a new freedom for Trump. But he has to be careful that I think, you know, life shifts quickly. Once that full report comes out, maybe it is that Barr had tried to just uh, gave a very simplified, a slightly partisan version as Nancy Pelosi is now intimating. Mm. But Mueller, the good news is I think most people think Mueller's an American hero. And uh, he did his job. That's hard work. He did it. And it was some kind of... Um, 
of, of, of a check to at least know we had a deep investigation. And so I, uh, I think he's a, did, a, did a, fine, a, a fine job, as we can tell so far. We'll know more when we get to read the report, not the one pager. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, I think it's way so. too, you're right, I think it's That's way too saying. early to draw the conclusions uh, that Trump has tried to draw, saying it's a total, complete and total exoneration, that the report is a, a big disappointment to those who wanted to, to get, get the goods on Trump, that it was a dud. I think it's way too early to say that. And when the Democratic, the, co the committees in the House start to dig in on details that hopefully will come out of this, this published report, I think, uh, it, I, I think the, the story is going to, going to change, going to evolve. Uh, it's not simply, okay, report's filed, he didn't find anything uh, it's all over. The press was wrong. All the talking heads were talking about nothing important for the last six months. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the end of the story by any means. I, I just want to quickly share a New Yorker cartoon that I saw today um, uh, regarding William Barr and this kind of brevity, but it's a, it's a cartoon that says, you know, young William Barr, and he's going up to hand a paper to his teacher as a kid in school, and he has a war and peace tucked under his mm -hmm. arm and the teacher says, well, thank you, uh, William, for turning this in early, but it's about war and peace isn't quite enough for this <laughs> book report. Yes. <laughs> it's about That's good. That's good, yeah. I mean, one thing that kind of s struck me in those first few days was some of the headlines were, Robert Mueller finds this, and then some of the headlines were, Bill Barr says Robert Mueller says this, mm -hmm. and those are very different things, and that's kind of the, almost the first draft of how much credibility the press is telling people how to, how to give this, and I thought it was interesting. There were a number of people on social media who put up you know, headlines next to each other and obviously let people know which one they thought was appropriate. Generally, the Barr says, Mueller says, <laughs> those people. Um, okay, staying on the, the press critic um, role a little bit, we're in the middle of, we're at the beginning, but it feels like we're in the middle of this wacky 2020 presidential race already with all of these candidates. The, the most diverse field we've ever seen by far, we have four women senators running, we have two African American senators running, we have um, the first openly gay um, major candidate running, we have a Latino former, um, we can talk about him. <laughs> We can also talk about how to pronounce his name. We have a Latino <laughs> former cabinet secretary, and we have a bunch of white guys who kind of have to grapple with not being necessarily the norm anymore. And it's interesting, people talk about them, the bees, you know, Bernie, uh, Biden, Beto, and to some extent, but Buttigieg, is that how you say it? Yes, who is um, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. So, you know, does he, some of the conversation is, does he go in the white male, has, you know, is it a straight white male category or is it just a white male category? Where does he fit in the kind of, you know, otherness? And, you know, we've also, there are, I think the press still smarting from 2016 in a lot of ways in coverage of Hillary is evaluating even in real time how some of these women candidates are covered. I noticed I put on my Elizabeth Warren campaign outfit today. This is what she wears every day pretty much. But, you know, is Elizabeth Warren too unlikable? Is Amy Klobuchar too mean? Is, are they being held to the same standards? Did Beto get too much of a boost because he's a cool guy and um, all of that? So so how do you, how do you think the press is doing on, in covering this kind of messy thing in real time. And, and, I, and I'd love for Lane to talk about Kathleen Blanco to some extent. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I mean, to be totally honest, I think they're feeding into a lot of all, you know, a lot of the stereotypes that are out there. Um, it seems what I've been watching right now so far is, you know, having all of the candidates have their say, do these, you know, these interviews with all of the outlets and then having the pundits come on to analyze all of that. And so, you know, that is one of the issues that I think we've um, all been reckoning with over the past couple of years and, of course, longer, which is, you know, what impact does the media have, you know, in terms of compounding these stereotypes and these images and making them real. Um, to, you know, kind of, you hear it from one person or you, it, it could be something that, you know, someone says about better work for two days, but if you say it for two months, then that's the permanence of what that person is and why that person's running and, and the pros and cons of that candidacy. So I think uh, that's what I'm seeing so far um, in terms of 
the women running, um, I, you know, I think what's interesting because there's more than one, you know, what I've been, in terms of the analysis that I've been following, you know, it's not, there's no like I'm running and I'm a woman, you know, there's more, the identity politics has to eventually move to the side and get to policy because of the number of women, which I think is a good thing. Um, and that can happen because of the multiplicity of the women that are running for president, you know, in, in the primary. And so that's something that we obviously did not see in the 2016 election. Um, briefly, you know, what the, the series that I produced about this very topic, politics and the media, called Sticky Wicket for the NPR affiliate here, WWNO, uh, the first episode was about Huey Long. Um, the second episode was about Jim Garrison, the former uh, New Orleans district attorney, and talk about another uh, yes. case of criminalization for um, homosexuality. Uh, Jim Garrison in 67 after uh, JFK was assassinated and the Warren report came out, uh, decided to launch his own investigation because he thought he could do a better job. Um, and he had a lot of power that no one uh, reigned in ever and he um, eventually indicted a gay man named Clay Shaw, who um, after a two year trial was found not guilty in under an hour. Um, but in the process of that, you know, he, he called Clay Shaw's um, alleged assassination of the president a homosexual thrill kill conspiracy. So that was the second episode, I could talk more about that. And then the third episode was about um, the first black mayor of New Orleans, Dutch Morial and uh, him being elected in 1978, and one year later, coincidence or not, the New Orleans Police Department went on their first ever strike. And so why did that happen when it happened? Um, and how did the press cover that? And then the fourth episode is about Kathleen Blanco, the f uh, first and currently only female governor of Louisiana, and how the media portrayed her in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and we decided to cover, you know, this period because, you know, doing one story on the, you know, the four years that she was the governor um, felt a little too unwieldy. And there's kind of the first half of her, uh, in her term in office and then, and then the second half, which is kind of like response to this disaster and then moving into recovery plan. But, you know, this was the only episode of the four that I actually got to speak to the politician, right? Because the other three people were deceased. And so this, and it was the most contemporary current uh, recent history of these four uh, historic examples. And so um, I was nervous for that one because I knew that this was a topic that people were still, you know, it was a very sensitive issue. And people didn't feel good about Kathleen Blanco. Um, people were not happy with how Kathleen Blanco responded to the storm, and it's only in you know some recent years that some people have decided to go back and look at what she was actually doing versus how she was being portrayed and treated on you know national television, whether it was you know Fox or CNN, which was you know they weren't all that different back then, um, also shockingly, and what was going on you know between the governor's office in the governor's mansion in Louisiana and the White House, where you have a female Democrat running the state and dealing with this catastrophe, and you have. Um, a Republican president in the White House deciding how much aid to give and um, and how to you know deflect blame and so there's so many moving parts in how Blanco was actually portrayed and a lot of people in more recent years you know a decade plus after the trauma have looked back and thought that she was you know Stephanie Grace included um, who I interviewed for in the story right. I have to get too meta here, but yes. <laughs> I said that, yes. Um, have said, you know, um, I was too harsh. I was too harsh on, on Governor Blanco, and why was I too harsh? And people, men and women, have come out and realized that it's this um, internalized sexism that we, that we um, project onto female politicians. And we saw that in 2016, and it will be really interesting to see now with a greater number of women running for 2020. Yeah. So what, I think 2020 is going to be, you, it's 100 years of women getting the right to vote, women's suffrage. 
So you're going to have, the Democrats have to have a woman as either the front of their ticket or as VP. I don't think you could run two men in 2020 in the Democratic Party. Do, do, mm -hmm. um, now, the question is if Donald Trump consolidates enough, about 85%, if he could convince somebody like Nikki Haley to take over for Pence, they put Pence's head of NASA or something like this, <laughs> um, and, um, and, they, and then have Nikki Haley run with him. Um, but I'm not sure she would want to do that for her career, but you never know. Um, I see 2020 that they're really, all of the people we're talking about have a crack at this thing. It's a little like 1976 when Jimmy Carter got the nomination. You know, I wrote on Carter and in October of 75, Las Vegas odds that Jimmy Carter was gonna get the Democratic nomination. This is October 75, about a year before beforehand, um, 101 odds in Las Vegas that Jimmy Carter wow. would get the Democratic nomination in 76. So how did Carter do it? Iowa. Iowa's going to produce a star. Joe Biden's got his lane. He's vice president. The guy, he's, he's, got a, he's going to carry around a 20% around with him, a 19%, or 18 maybe. He's going to, if he, he looks like he's getting in it. Bernie is the big surprise. He's going to hang in there with his. Who is that third big person? Is it Kamala Harris? Is it Beto O'Rourke? Is it uh, Amy Klobuchar, who's ranked fourth in Iowa right now? And she could end up surprising people in right. Iowa. Never Iowa's going to give somebody a big bounce. Cory Booker's starting to track a little bit right now. Um, you know, so the there really are ten possible um, you know scenarios um, f for being the nominee right now. Maybe more, but certainly ten, I think, viable candidates. It's right. quite exciting. Um, Tom, I'm wondering, you, you've written about Princess Diana, so she was not a politician, but kind of was. I mean, do you see any of the same dynamics at work covering public figures who are female but who are not politicians? Well, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. She was female, but she was her. I mean, yeah. she, was, <laughs> she was a princess. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't think... I don't think uh, sort of gender stereotypes had anything to do, but that was a that was a, a good example of media frenzy. The the coverage of uh, of Diana. Um, I was uh, my my bureau at Time Magazine was just a few hundred yards from the the site of that that accident, wow. and I was drawn into. I mean, I mean the, as I say, it was just a complete uh, media uh, frenzy, and um, we uh, at Time Magazine we put her on the cover that story in the cover of Time Magazine three weeks in a row. And uh, I was completely exhausted by the end of those, <laughs> those three weeks. We just, we just uh, reported it and reported and, and, and uh, wrote and uh, tried, to, um, tried to get to uh, the investigators early on, which, which wasn't, wasn't very easy. But it was clear from the beginning that this was going to be a ma major in investigation uh, which is unusual. I mean, the, the French government, I don't think any, any government, I'm not sure the U.S. would just, would, uh, would spend uh, all those resources and all that time investigating a road accident. But it was b because it was the princess and because very, very quickly in the media coverage and just, we, you didn't really have the so social media in those days, but just in public opinion in general, there was a, there was a, a feeling that this was, uh, it was an assassination, that it was a plot. And uh, this was this was a current that ran through uh, a, a lot of the media coverage, and um, there were uh, talk about fake news. I mean, there were all sorts of things that cropped up in in, in the press. You know that the uh, the driver who had been the head of security at, at the Ritz was uh, that he was actually working for the uh, working for the CIA or working for French French intelligence. Uh, that that Prince Philip had had, had ordered the M MI6 to engineer. An accident, and 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 so so on and so forth. So it was, it was a good example of uh, kind of media overkill of uh, of fake news, uh, but I, d I don't think it had you know anything to do with her her status as a, as a woman. Okay. And the coverage was was very different in those days because you didn't you didn't have the blogosphere, you didn't right. have the social media, you know. It was it was the written press and 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 TV. TV, yeah. Yeah, and so ha having done that for three or four weeks for, for Time Magazine, um, a colleague and I said, well, we've got a lot of material here. You know, maybe we can, we can see if we can get somebody interested in a book. But I, at that time, I thought probably three or four book deals already. Um, 
but we just cold called uh, Andrew Wiley, who was one of the top agents in the, in the world, and uh, he snapped it up. The next thing we knew, uh, we had a contract to deliver a book in six weeks that was sold in 14 countries, so that wow. was... Uh, yeah, that, that spoiled me. I thought writing books was, was easier <laughs> after that. Say, Making we, the we bestseller list was a piece <laughs> of cake, and it, it hasn't happened to me since. So anyway, wow. but I'm, I'm still hoping. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we move on, I want to get you, I saw a little fist bump when I mentioned Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg. How do you Certainly. Buttigieg, is that how you say it? It's, yeah. He's, I mean, he's being so well received, and it's really interesting. What do you, sure. I'm wondering your thoughts on it. And his memoir was cited as the greatest, politi- by the Guardian reviewer, the greatest wow. political memoir since Barack. His memoir was cited as, uh, by the Guardian a reviewer a few days ago as the greatest political mar- memoir since Dreams of Our, My Father. Say, like, was, really per- was by Barack Obama, and I'm from Illinois, so uh-huh. I voted for Obama. I'm not even supposed to say that as a journalist, but I <laughs> voted for Obama as, as senator, and, as, um, and, I, and I was very proud. I, I love that book. I meant so much. I think um, his candidacy means a lot, uh, obviously, for queer visibility. I keep thinking about um, what an individual who isn't uh, perhaps in elementary school or in junior high school is is thinking about and reacting to when you're seeing such a um, impressive um, Midwestern um, and cute <laughs> <laughs> presidential candidate um, out there killing it um, on a daily basis. Um, and it's quite astounding to see. Do you think yeah. the press, I'm sorry. So I just um, saw a thing in the New York Times this morning that according to one poll, at least, he's, he's running third in Iowa. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, just he's extremely young, too, for this. Mm-hmm. So that's the other thing that sets him apart is he's 37, I believe. Right. Mm. So that's, you know, And, and without the traditional experience, I mean, of course, there was some talk here is Mitch Landry who experienced enough, you know, only being a mayor. No, just as a mayor, but, I mean, this guy's a mayor <laughs> of a much smaller place. <laughs> that's, we don't need to go there, okay? He's not running. <laughs> You know, we should also, I mentioned her in passing, Kamala Harris is really doing an interesting Mm -hmm. thing because, you know, they've moved California up now for the Democrats. So if you're a vote counter, somebody's going to merge from Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, but it goes to California and she could win a boatload of, uh, of delegates there. So keep her an eye on Kamala Harris also. Mm -hmm. Mm. And is also getting really good buzz. Yeah. um, Yeah. Had a good rollout. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, do, you, do any of you have, when you look at the press landscape covering politics right now, do you see developments, new um, techniques, new features that you think those are really good, those really help people? And conversely, do you see some that really make you cringe? <laughs> well, um, I live in France most of the, most of the year, and so um, I, I try to tune in to, to CNN International and uh, to try to get a fix on U.S. News. So uh, CNN is, is my main TV source of, of U.S. News, so I'm, I'm getting maybe a fragmentary view. Um, but I think, I, I'm not sure it's helpful this, to have these panel after panel, sorry, Doug, panel after answer. panel after <laughs> panel after, after panel of, of talking heads. And often, and, uh, again, CNN is my main reference, but I'm not particularly a um, criticizing them. You have one show after another, uh, particularly when there's a hot thing like the Mueller report or, or um, you know, the, the summit with, uh, with North Korea or something. One show after another, after another, after another is going to have, uh, you're going to see these four heads, six heads, talking about the same thing with no new information. Uh, so I don't know how, uh, I, I didn't find it particularly, I heard some very interesting analyses, you know, here and there, but is it is a format I didn't find it particularly informative because at the end of a, you know, four hours of binge watching, mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't get the impression that I, that I had actually learned anything that I didn't know in the first, uh, first half hour. So that's, that's my particular take. Mm. That was mine too. So. And also nobody's invited me to be a talking oh. head so, <laughs> so far. But I mean, you'd agree, right? The role of the talking head now is, uh, is to place context and to a certain extent um, sanity on a certain audience, right? Because the reality is that much news is not broken by the media industry anymore. It's broken on social media and our role is to be, and on Twitter, and our role is to be, uh, it's to be a check on uh, otherwise uh, an aspect of reality and a form of media that has no fact check. 
Yeah, you know, it, 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 it does have a useful purpose, but I think it's a, it's a matter of proportion. And maybe, maybe just uh, there, there may be ways of thinking of a different format to do, to do the same thing. Hmm. You know, like Amanpour, for example, has a, uh, an, is she on uh, domestically? Because I see her in, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I see her in uh, interna um, CNN International. She has like 30 minutes, her show's an hour, she has like 30, 25, 30 minutes sitting down with one person. And I, I think that's, um, when it's a good guest, uh, and many of them are, I think that's interesting because you can really get into issues and really get into a, a deeper analysis. But when it's all, when it's all chopped up with, with um, you know, multiple talking heads, I find that less, less helpful, uh, less informative, and less interesting than, than a more in-depth interview format. Mm -hmm. So that's my two cents. Well, uh, you know, as someone that is in broadcast journalism and podcasting, something that I've realized is that, you know, podcasting is on the rise and, you know, there's like 700,000 podcasts you can listen to now, um, including one of mine if you're interested. <laughs> um, but I think something that podcasting has done is that ha that's radical is that it's broken away from what other news outlets feel they're forced to do, which is to participate and feed the 24-hour news cycle. Mm -hmm. So when you have a podcast, you know, like the New York Times that has a podcast, I mean, the New York Times it's doing, is doing its thing, you know, 24 hours a day, but the podcast is coming out in the morning, you're listening to a 20-minute story, it's in-depth about one thing, you're, at least for me personally, I'm walking away from that 20 minutes feeling like I learned something as opposed to the four hours of binging CNN or honestly listening to NPR where I, where I work, but I can compare both, you know, it's like if I walk, you know, and then where, where I work, you know, you hear it in the bathroom, so you can't escape it. Like it's everywhere. It's in the hallways, it's in the bathroom. And sometimes I'll, a whole day will go by and I only heard three stories on repeat and I listened to it all day. And that's a huge problem. And I think what's bold about podcasting that I'm kind of realizing is that it's saying we don't have to do that to keep people coming back day after day. And they're almost, while they're progressive in format, returning to this daily dose and not, uh, and not um, repeating themselves every day. Because if the, if the New York Times podcast did, told the same story it told the day before, you'd stop listening. And so they're coming out with a fresh story every day that's in-depth and saying, we'll see you tomorrow. Not mm -hmm. we'll see you in you know, 30 seconds. And it's so important because that's where readers are now. Remo a lot of, uh, we haven't brought up the beleaguered state of the news industry and how that's affecting, like the, way, the fact that we need the fourth estate more than ever and yet the fourth estate right, is the only American state that's wholly dependent on capitalism to exist mm -hmm. on, on a bottom line and on a budget and on getting ratings and having advertising, et cetera. Um, and I, I just keep thinking about how the way that as readers fall off, it's so important to go to the mediums where the people are. Um, and that intimacy of being in somebody's earbuds um, seems to be the way to go and seems to be counteracting a lot of the very negative trends um, that are going on in the news industry. So um, I'll toss out a few statistics if that's okay. And uh, maybe because, so the newsroom jobs fell 25% in the last 10 years and then Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts another 10% in the next five. More than 60% of journalists saw their newsrooms shrink last year. And then 75% of all journalism jobs are now located on e either coast. So we're, in, we're dealing with news deserts. Um, and I keep thinking, um, I keep thinking that this can't help but, if that, but impact and affect the way that we're able to effectively cover um, the events of our world and also to help, uh, help readers, help listeners, help viewers make sense of a reality where we aren't breaking the news anymore. Do you guys have any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the, it's, the CNN does, for example, where I work, I'm the presidential historian at CNN. There are a lot of challenges that are going on. I wrote a biography of Walter Cronkite, and when Cronkite quit CBS News in um, 1981, March of 81 was his last broadcast, journalism had about a 70% approval rating. Mm -hmm. Today, journalism has like a 15% approval rating. It's gone from people thinking journalists are great to thinking it's all fake news or too many talking heads mm -hmm. or all, and whatever the manifestation is, 
Um, it, it's a sad development, but on the other hand, we have more, di more diversification. It's because once Cronkite left, at the same time CNN was created and cable news was created, and now you have that phenomenon, but then the social media revolution and everybody's getting their news from different sites, and if you tend to be, which is audience by the cheers I've heard, seem to be more left center, you're gonna go to left center media, and then if you're right center, you go to right center, and everybody's kind of smorgasbord, we're choosing our news that we want to be a personal reflection of ourselves, mm -hmm. like we curate our iPod or something, mm -hmm. or, and, uh, or our Kindles, what we're reading. It's like, here's how I see the world. And um, so it makes it harder to have just one news source. So while there are too many boxes on CNN, I've enjoyed watching the CNN town halls recently. Mm -hmm. They're doing with all these candidates where Don Lemon well, was with Cory Booker a night ago and giving him a couple of hours to do a town hall format. Not perfect, but audience participation from South Carolina. There were a lot of good questions and it's a way of introducing yourself to the, the candidates. And also there's not really one CNN. Um, each hour show, dirt, certain ones do a better job of doing a news broadcasting than others. I think CNN International is better than mm. CNN domestic. Because mm. here we seem to be creating, wanting food fights all the time. Mm. And mm. we like uh, outrageousness, and that's the other problem. I'm com people, I try to be balanced. I'm presidential historian, and I try to do judicial, and I'm, I'm kind of able to hang in there with it. But if you want clicks, say something crazy. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's all people want, ratchet it up. Um, I had a book out called The Nixon Tapes and I and about all of Richard Nixon's Watergate tapes and a friend of mine from the Washington Post, old buddy of mine from grad school and his wife who used to edit Washingtonian Magazine came to see, my wife Ann's here with me and came to see Ann and I and I was about to come out with the book and he said, oh, you're not gonna be able to move the Nixon tapes talking about the Watergate and all and I, and, and I said, well, well, you know, I, yeah. He said, no, no, let me see your book. And he started going through it, and he came with this fat Nixon tape books and said, you have panda sex? Nixon got the pandas from China. Okay. <laughs> and Nixon on a tape talked about the pandas breeding. Uh -huh. It's like, well, there, I think we have a sense. It's, it was like little kooky Nixon, like Nixon with Elvis kind of stuff. <laughs> he said, that's all you need to market your book. He went and put it on social media to a few journalists but things. The thing just, my phone went off the hook. Mm -hmm. Panda sex, Nixon contemplates, new book, the Nixon wow. tapes. Um, just this week, Susan Page of the USA Today mm -hmm. just did a story, Barbara Bush said, Trump almost gave me a heart attack. Well, that became blown up. And whatever else is in the book, you, they, they're selling it on that click. That's mm -hmm. click bait. And journalists, all even the best newspapers are falling prey to that because of the shrinking amount. That it's the tabloidization of news and it's a very sad mm. development in our country. Interesting, mm. okay. Um, on that note, panda sex, I think we're, <laughs> and Nixon and panda sex, I should say. <laughs> yeah. We're ready to go to questions, is that right? They're too busy so, clicking it right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yes, sir, and please um, speak up. I'm not an active journalist these days, so that's not happening to me now. But mm -hmm. I, if I think back, I was at Time Magazine for 22 years. I don't remember anybody ever telling me not to, not to investigate a specific story. And, and, and that, 
it seems it may be some kind of conspiratorial thought behind that behind that behind your question. I'm not saying you're, you know. Well, Well, it's, it's certainly failed us in, in, in lots of ways, but I don't think uh, you, can, you can say that some, uh, some editor or some, some publisher or some force kind of behind the pulling all the, the you know, it's, well, it's saying, uh, oh, stay away from that, you know, don't, I mean, I, it, I'm sure it happens. In my experience, I, I, I never saw it, you know. It may happen, but I, I, I just can't think of a specific example of, of that in my experience. I can in, in in my case when I, I I'm I'm primarily a book author and, and I I write journalism as well but I'm not writing it on a daily basis so I'm not getting uh, no editors breathing down my neck because I just I kind of take you know I eat what I kill in terms of as a freelancer so I bring the stories I'm interested in to them and if they take it great and if they don't want it I go elsewhere I go you know pack up my bags and go find another shop um, but. Um, in, in my experience with book publishing, which is an industry in itself, it often doesn't like to talk about or think about itself in, in any terms besides the most romantic. Um, when, when I was writing Tinderbox, um, the things that were giving my editor most pause tend to be moments where I was talking about um, how the, the semi-closeted gay community of New Orleans was also responsible in hushing the upstairs lounge fire. How um, and my editor, I mean, I could see the sweat beads forming on his head when I was talking about how, um, you know, owners of the major gay bars met with some of the gay activist leaders who had come from Los Angeles and New York City in the days following the fire um, and told them to stop holding press conferences and making a ruckus trying to hold memorials for the, the, the 32 dead of the fire um, and to st instead be quiet so that people will start to, so that traffic will start to pick up at their gay bars. Um, and I wasn't censored or anything like that. My editor, when he was sweating in this instance, said, just, he just looked at me and he said, make sure you get it right. Mm -hmm. That was what he said. Yeah. And that's often what will happen. An editor will come to you and just say, are you sure how important it is? You know, they wouldn't necessarily say don't do it, but they would kind of raise the bar maybe a little higher than it would be some other time. And I have to say, I guess in a very general sense, I feel like perhaps editors are a little more sensitive to their readers' political preferences in this era, like you said, of declining circulation, a real kind of business crisis <laughs> that journalism is in, that you know, it doesn't necessarily influence choices, but it's, it's there. And when you say, live in a state where most, you know, 50, high 50 percentage points um, voted for Donald Trump and you're, piling on Donald Trump, it's, you know, and you get a lot of complaints, it, it registers. I, I don't know what the, it'll be interesting to kind of go back, look back at what the ultimate effect was, but um, that's just kind of the environment we're all in now. Yes. Drinking my beer. I mean, I mean, I feel like, <laughs> yeah. I feel like Well, I, I, I think Elizabeth Warren's low in the polls for the reasons you just perfectly said. I mean, the DNA uh, problem is just killing her because you want to be authentic if you're a politician showing something inauthentic, and she hasn't yet been able to really get away from it, and I think the beer thing didn't really go over well, nor did Beto O'Rourke's visit to the dentist. Doesn't mean <laughs> there's not recovery for her. Um, but I think her larger problem, you've touched on maybe it is the largest problem, it's the DNA problem, but Bernie Sanders is a problem for her. If he wasn't running, a lot of her, his votes might very well go for a, a, 
Elizabeth Warren's economic populist message. And she does have the advantage of, if you really, really hate Trump, she goes after him <laughs> with a finger in his face, and that appeals to certain people. But with Bernie in there, I don't know where she, her voters seem to be drifted towards Bernie Sanders. I didn't think there was enough air for both of them, in my opinion. Uh -huh. It feels to me as if we're well on the way. Well, the, um, are you talking about uh, mainstream newspapers and uh, TV? Uh, Repeat the question. I don't oh. My question what? is, and I'll re rephrase it. We talked about pure journalism and the respect of the media and when Cronkite retired being in, in the high 70s and now at <laughs> and I see what feels like a slippery slope from good journalism to tabloidism, and I'm wondering, are we on the way down the hill to yellow journalism? Because we've been there before. It's not like it mm. can't happen. Well, if you're talking about mainstream newspapers like the, you know, the, the Washington Post or the New York Times uh, uh, and and, and many others uh, that are serious and, and, and conscientious. I don't, I don't see them becoming tabloidized. Uh, I don't uh, about the newspapers okay. as much as I do broadcast. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Broadcasting, definitely. And the whole, the whole social media thing, I mean, even though they're not, uh, they're not news outlets, they're part of the whole news environment. And, well, you've already seen that. It's, I mean, it's already, it's already become um, uh, uh, yellow journalism. Is, well, it's not even journalism, but uh, sensationalism, uh, Fake news, um, hysteria. I mean, you, you've you know runs the whole gamut, and um, I don't rumor know. Rumor mongering. Sorry. Yeah, rumor mongering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. rumor mongering. Um, I don't I'm, know. I don't know if we're there yet. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, one thing that's happened over time is it used to be that there were a limited number of broadcast outlets, limited number of newspapers. They were kind of the gatekeepers. So if they saw something, yeah. something that was a rumor, something that you know, it wouldn't necessarily get out into the public consciousness. And now there are all these other ways for something to get out, and then people react to it. And then, as a journalist, you feel like it's kind of your duty to, to vet it. Well, not, not just to jump. If you're a responsible journalist, is it true? Can I prove it? Can I disprove it? What does it mean? And then, but, you know, the kind of responsible journalists are, you know, they're all over that, but there is also less control over the environment than they used to have. And this is all kind of a way of wrestling with that. Also, I think you see this um, really clearly in the, one of the biggest discrepancies between the New York Times and the Washington Post right now, where the Washington Post has a list, you know, a long list of how many times they can, you know, f um, of the falsehoods? defend oh. uh, Trump lying and using the word lying, where the New York Times um, has only actually said Donald Trump lied twice maybe mm -hmm. there have been like two times and every other time they're using honestly synonyms but it's it's <laughs> falsehoods um but the post know. uses falsehoods too they don't say lie well the, the they, post has said but they lie have more, many more times than the time that's a new policy so, then okay I'll tell you a very quick story when jimmy carter was president he lost to ronald reagan in 80 and the washington post a guy named dotson raider reported in a reliable sources, it was called the ear back then, that Jimmy Carter, uh, rumor has it that there was a bug placed in Blair House when the Reagans were staying there, meaning the Carter administration had bugged the Reagans. Well, for Carter, all he was leaving office with, he just got killed in 80, was his integrity. And now they're saying after that he would bugged Blair House to listen in on the Reagans, Carter asked for a retraction, and the Washington Post said, no, it was in our rumor. It was in our, oh, our yeah. the ear. It's, yeah. And we said there's a rumor. So they're reporting the rumor. Carter sued. He had Terrence Adamson do a lawsuit, 
and it got hot. Ben Bradley and Kathleen mm. Graham back then, they, they refused. It was going to the courts. And Ben Bradley got on a plane and tracked down Dotson Raider. And he said, uh, well, um, yeah, I don't know. Somebody did tell me this. And the whole story broke down. And they had to do a front page apology to Jimmy Carter wow. for reporting a rumor. But he had to sue for a year. And they, they also, he got the lawsuit to be held in Georgia, in America's Georgia. Wow. In his backyard where he was taking them to. But it's a large point that sometimes rumors are getting reported in these little sections that are yeah. personality sections. Like, uh, we heard that such and such. Well, that gets, starts getting fed. And people, are, you're, you're asking, you know, well, you understand. But it's a, so this yeah. is a problem. And unfortunately, that's what often sells things, is these mm -hmm. sensationalized stories. And the, the one place this shows up is in the comment section, where mm -hmm. the reporter doesn't say it, but somebody else will say it. And then it's on the news site. And then the news site exactly. is disseminating it. It's and definitely perfect. That's yeah. right. Ma this is a topic of many internal discussions at certain <laughs> news sites that sure. maybe I've worked at. Um, can we, do we have time for one more? Or? journalism. I, I have to say, investigative journalism is doing pretty well given the economics of the industry, thankfully. And um, it's a couple things. It's uh, that there are some big investors behind big news organizations, the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos, obviously. The New York Times is selling tons of online subscriptions. Um, LA Times has a new local owner that's really investing, so that's great. It's Metro papers are really endangered. That's where the hits are coming. On the other hand, they are really investing in it. It's one of the ways they're building their brand. I mean, it's one of the things we're doing here at The Advocate. Um, there was just one of the best series, I think, in all, all of this year came out of the Miami Herald, which was about the current, um, you should all read it, it's about a guy named Jeff Epstein, who's a finance, a big, rich guy from Palm Beach who basically was a sex trafficker. And the current Secretary of Labor, who was the US Attorney at the time, really helped them cover it up and really silence the victims. And it's just an awful story, but it came out of the Miami Herald. There are nonprofits out there that are really investing in it. One called ProPublica is very well funded, and they are funding positions in individual newsrooms. There's a lot of, there's some good stuff. It's not as bad as you would think, given the overall state of the industry. What's bad is, I'm sorry to hijack this a little bit, but um, there's, a, it, you also Spotlight, the movie Spotlight, so you mm -hmm. know about that case. Um, the real Walter, Walter Robinson, I think, the, the Michael Keaton character, no, the John, Anyway, one of the editors came and spoke at an investigative conference here in New Orleans, and what he was saying, I think, is the real danger. He said, you know, we have the investigative reporters at the Boston Globe. What we don't have is the beat reporters, and a story like that came out of the person who was sitting in the courthouse who was watching what was happening. That's the person, that's the broken link, and that's where these stories often come from. So to me, that's a real part of the crisis. And oh okay, we're we're done. Thank I got you. this. So thank you all.